This is Joelle, you're watching Fluffy Kawai Show and today we'll be talking about working with overseas factories. So right now I've been working with people in different countries for about 10 years and on a daily basis I'm working with factories in China, uh, people in the US and I have a lot of experience doing that and I would like to share with you how to find factories, what to avoid, what to be sure of and a lot of things that I learned the hard way by making mistakes uh, that I would like to let you know in the case you are interested in working with factories so you guys won't make the same mistake as I did and also you'll learn way quicker by not having to do all the mistakes. I've been contacted by persons wanting to create their own Lolit brand which I did and over the years a lot of my contacts and friends have asked me how I did that so I'm also doing that video to help anyone that could be interested in the topic. I have four points that are the main main things that you have to be sure of. The first point is deadline, then price, quantity or minimum order quantity, and the last one is communication. So I'll go over the four points and then I'll talk a lot of other different things. So first of all, deadline. You have to know your industry and what your market is. So for example, I do two things mainly. I do Lolita dresses and I do cheerleading uniforms. So you can understand that the teams that order the uniforms to go to a competition, if the deadline is missed by only one day that I receive the package, not on Friday, the latest possible time for the competition that is on Saturday, but if it's on Monday, which is basically the next weekday, like open day, most people would say it's no big deal, it's just one day, but the whole team has nothing to wear. And if they had to wait until the Friday to know if they will get their uniform or not, they don't have time to wear something else. So a lot of my customers don't have practice wear something that they could wear instead of. And so in a few very few rare occasions, my suppliers were late and I could not deliver them for the competition and it was a disaster for me because it showed a really really bad image of my brand that I missed a deadline so important for my customer. The, the factory didn't care, so oh, it's just one day, what's the difference? So first you have to know what your deadline is and you have to know that the factory most of the time will not care about your deadline. So what I do now is that since that occurred about a year ago, I said to my customers, my deadline, like order time is four weeks. It used to be four weeks and now it's eight weeks. So if you don't order your things eight weeks before the championship, then I do not guarantee that uh, you will get them on time. So some people do end up ordering after that, then it's up to you if you want to accommodate that kind of late and then you have to rush in, the factory have to rush in, sometimes you pay more, sometimes not, sometimes it's possible to make the order rush, sometimes it's just that you pray that uh, the deadline will work. So you have to take care of that and that's super important. For example, if uh, for Lolita, I said that uh, the reservation is that long and then you will uh, get your dress for that about in two, three months. Then if it's one or two days late, it's way less terrible because unless that person really wanted to wear your dress to one event or something, but it's less important depending on your industry and your customers. And also, I never ever tell my suppliers which is my real deadline. First, what I tell them is that if I know that they are usually on time, I give them at least a week extra. 
that I say my deadline deadline okay let's say uh, the championship is May 20th I would say that I need everything by 1st of May so now if they want a two day late then I have like three weeks, extra weeks. And of course I need to receive everything, I need to pack everything and ship everything. So I need a few days to do that. And the post needs a few days and if it's a different country it takes longer. So yeah. And then sometimes you realize that the factory is not going to deliver on that deadline. And so then you say, okay, you cannot uh, do that for the 1st of May, but my deadline is really like the 10th. So please, 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 I really need it for the 10th. My experience is that you have to remind them of the deadline all the time if you want to be sure to have that on time. It really depends on also cultural differences. Being in Switzerland, you know, like time and uh, being precise and on time and stuff like that is very very important for us but a lot of other countries have very different views of time and for them maybe it's less important and so you have to tell them that it's important for you and why you need that deadline because maybe the customer has something that they need the uniform or the product for and if you don't tell them maybe they won't care as much this is deadline i hope that i covered it because it's mostly where it can be difficult now let's talk about price so of course if you for example me if i would produce something in switzerland having for example a seamstress make a dress from scratch in switzerland and in china you can imagine that it's gonna be a different price right then you have to know what you will get for that price because of course you can get way cheaper prices overseas in Asia but it will not mean that you will have the exact same quality as if you were to order it from Switzerland or France or something but okay let, let's say for example that uh, I make a dress in China and it costs me $100 because I have to pay for printing the fabric and the shipping costs and everything. Let's say $100. I would say that making the same exact dress in Switzerland, like printing everything in Switzerland and uh, cutting in Switzerland and sewing in Switzerland could easily go 300 or 400 even 500 depending on who will do that and the difficulty. So now let's say that that's my business and I want to sell that dress so I need to make a margin on top of that so usually I've been told that you should not go for lower than 50 or 60 percent so let's say that you want to have a 50 percent margin so you will sell your dress from China 150 and your dress from Switzerland 750 okay so maybe the one in Switzerland is amazingly more beautifully done but the pattern is the same, the print is the same, the dress is basically the same. Maybe it's really really like more beautifully done but the customer in Europe or in the US or maybe even in Asia is your customer ready to pay 570 bucks for your dress? Probably not, unless you are angelic pretty, and even that, they don't sell that many dresses of that price. So, probably you will not be able to afford to make a dress in a country where the labor is so expensive that then you cannot sell your dress to your market. So you have to know the market and the price that people would generally pay for something like that also taking into account that you are uh, not as well known uh, as the big brands and that the quality might not be as good as the big brands so take that into account uh, then you should have your target price and then see what you can afford to do for example right now um, 
we had troubles with the factories in China. I think you've heard about that with uh, my Lolita brand. So basically some of the issues that I had is that the quality and the way they constructed the dress was not really, not at all what I wanted. But then I had to pay for the fabric, I had to pay for the dress, they sent me the sample and it was not good. So then I had to find a seamstress in France, redo the whole patterns, buy the fabric again and redo the whole dress. And even if she gave me a very good price for that one, it was a lot of money to do that twice. So then choosing China, and choosing that factory that made a bad job ended up costing me way more because I had to redo it. So you really have to see, I would say that go for the highest quality of the price that you can afford taking into account your target market. Of course, you can find somebody make you your dress for maybe 20 dollars and you could still sell it at 150 if you wanted but it would be so crappy that uh, it will not be a good image for your brand so really go for good quality and then see what kind of factory you can afford for that price that you want to make then my next point is quantity because quantity is very important, especially in China, and it also has an impact on price. So for example, that person in France, she would charge me for the pattern making. So then if I make just one dress, it costs me a lot to make the pattern and the dress and the fabric. But if I make 10 dresses, she had to do the pattern only once. So sometimes in China, they don't charge you for the pattern making, but they have decreasing prices based on quantity. And you can totally understand that if you make one dress, 10 dresses or 100 dresses or even 1000 dresses you get a different price so if you wonder why H&M and such can have so low prices it's because they order so much volume of one design that they have a very good deal on the fabric and on the factory and everything so usually the more you order the cheaper it is but not all the time. So for example, let's say cheerleading, what I do for my customers. My customers really want to be able to buy just one because sometimes either last year I made an order of 20 of the uniform and this year they have just one new person. Then I won't tell them, no, you have to order 20 because that would make no sense. I now want to sell them just that one uniform. So I have to find factories that allow me to do just one uniform. Of course, for them it's easier if I already ordered 20 of them, but sometimes I have orders of people doing individuals or a lot of time I have group stands, so it's five people doing a group competition and so them, they, they need a special uniform. So yeah, usually you want to do only just one. And most of the time, when I contact a the factory, they, they tell me, you have to order at least 200 or something. So first of all, I don't want to order, just send them a picture and get 200 of them because first I want to see the quality and check how it is. So I want them to be able to make just one and ship it to me and sometimes they won't. So you have to be aware of that. And the second part is that, okay, let's say I just started my company, which is now I'm like one year old, but still for fluffy to wear. I could never order 200 of the same dress, especially in Lolita, you have different uh, cuts and colorways. So let's say I have 200 of that one colorway, one cut. It's impossible to sell, okay? Because you'll never have the right sizes. So usually, yeah, when it's 200, uh, they, they ask of the same style then they allow you to make different sizes. But you don't want to buy so many because then it will be impossible to sell. So just make a deal with the factory that you can order very few at first and then 
if your company grows then you can order more each time or make more of the same design that you made before but really if they say no 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 you have to order at least 50 or something really consider that because i think it's really risky at first to order a lot and then not be sure to be able to sell them so take that into account and for example the problem that i had with my first factory is that i negotiated at first that i only wanted a few but then they said oh you know we don't want to work with you anymore because you make so many different designs and they're all just one or two of each and it's really complicated and they stopped and they shipped my fabric back and we don't want to hear about you again so you really don't want that to happen so really really tell them in advance that you will only have a few pieces and sometimes it will narrow down very very much the kind of factories you can work with but you cannot go with a factory who will ask you a minimum of 10,000 if you only just want 10 because it won't be the same kind of factories maybe it's a different kind of factory that will work with smaller brands you have to take that into account and so there's one term that we use usually when we talk to factories it's MOQ minimum order quantity and so basically the first question that I ask them is what is your MOQ because if your minimum order quantity is 2000 for example I also do pins and uh, stickers and stuff like that but I only order like 50 to 300 or stuff like that but never would I be able to first uh, stock everything like 2000 or something and I will not be sure that I could sell them so when you order something be sure that you can place your inventory somewhere and have not that stay in your living room for 10 months or something and also that you are sure that you can sell that amount in a reasonable time and the last point that is really important really really important is communication so you have to first that's super stupid but you have to find somebody that speaks at least one language like you so basically i don't expect people in china or in the us speaking french so i speak english so that's okay i can talk to them in english but sometimes you would find fantastic people working uh, with fabric and making clothes for example in turkey or something but it's very rare that they speak english or french so be sure to find people that speak your language that's the first and then for example the last factory the problem that i had is that when i receive a sample i check everything and uh, come back with a list of things to check and usually my list is this big all these small details things that i'm not happy with and everything and usually it's very detailed wording in english that um, I'm not happy about this or that and if the person is not being able to speak enough English to understand the special details that you're telling then they probably won't fix it and the next sample will again be wrong so their ability of speaking as well as yours for example I speak a bit of German but I will never be able to talk business in German with a factory because I don't know enough German to be able to give precise things to somebody who who has to understand and make something so you have to find the language that both of you speak well enough to understand and for example the last factory there, there was problems with the sewing and the execution but also a lot of problem with the communication and the person told me that all of my emails were like an exam in English and uh, that we have to be patient and uh, explain things slowly and uh, yeah so it's too much work so if the quality was fantastic and they could speak so bad English maybe I could do an effort but since it's difficult to talk to them in English and the quality is not on par so then we have to stop working with them and 
I also had problems when I started with my cheerleading business in the US so an American person at that point it was 10 years ago so maybe my English wasn't as good but it was not really a problem of understanding it was mostly communication ways and also then I go back to the cultural differences Swiss people are super precise and strict and everything so if I write to you an email with five different questions I'm expecting an answer to all my five questions and that's a tip for you guys if you write all your questions on the same line and, and put all the questions ne next to each other anyone will miss any questions when I have many questions I always do that I, I put bullets in it question one uh, how long will it take question two how which is the cost question four what colors do you have question five and if I do that with numbers, then for them it's also way easier to just check the numbers that they answer everything. And usually when people do that to me, sometimes they miss some questions, but it's not intentional. What they will say is that, uh, okay, here's the answer for one, two, three, and four and five, I don't know yet, I have to check, and I'll get back to you on that. And I love that because they just didn't ignore four and five. They just let me know that they didn't needed more time to go over them. And so in that case, that, that was super helpful for me to know that I will take care of that later. And usually the next day I have the answer. So bullet points your questions with numbers. So that's way easier uh, for communication. Something else that you have to know is that first you'll never be 100% happy or maybe it's just me because I'm such a perfectionist but just so you know there will always be something to be fixed and then you have to decide do we do another iteration so do I start over make another sample or change factories because it's too troublesome or okay it's not exactly like I wanted but it could work or we could fix that on the big production you have to know that and this is also knowing yourself and the, the product and the market that you want so if you want to sell something kind of cheap then maybe it's okay if it's not perfect if you want to price your item super high and be a luxury brand then everything has to be top-notch so this is between you and your market and everything that decide the threshold of okay it's good enough or no let's start over I know people who has spent one year of just sending back stuff to factories until they're 100% happy and this is a lot of time and this is a lot of money too so you really have to decide if it's something that you're willing to do or not and to go back on the cultural differences this is really important to take into account that people in different countries will have different ways of telling you the truth so for example i have a factory in pakistan and i hate working with them but i've tried different factories in pakistan in the same industry and it's always the same they will lie to you about deadline. They will say, yes, 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 sir. on Monday you get pictures. And it's Thursday and you still don't have pictures. Yeah, yeah, tomorrow, tomorrow I send you pictures. And they don't. And so you have to harass them. And then they make a mistake and they'll say, yes, yes, we will fix. And they don't. And then they say, oh, but you can fix them in Switzerland. And... I will pay for it. I said, okay, so then I will give you the, an invoice of my fee because it's super expensive to do it in Switzerland. Are you sure you want to do that? And then you pay. Yes, yes, I pay. Okay. And then you send them the invoice and then they don't answer to you anymore. Even if you keep harassing them to, hey, you told me you were gonna give me back the money no no news for them until you have a new order and then you say hey I have that new order but you didn't pay back the other yes yes I can deduct it from your new order so in the end I ended up getting my money back but 
know that they will lie about deadlines and fixing stuff and such and me as a Swiss people it will look like a lie but for them it might look like they didn't want me to wait too long and tell them that they will send me pictures in two weeks because I might not find out too long so telling me a shorter deadline is nicer to me or something we just have different ways of interpreting the truth okay so for me it seems like a lie but not for them so also be aware of that in really deadlines they never 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 I tend to say that people in US usually they tend to work the deadline really well or if they have a problem they will tell you listen uh, this came up and I might not be able to make that deadline how could we arrange you can I ship it somewhere else directly to your customer or something and that helps a lot because you know in advance and you know what to do but when they don't tell you anything or they tell you yeah yeah, yeah I ship tomorrow and they ship in three weeks that's super difficult to know what to do and to tell your customer so be careful about that and also then I would like to tell you about trust because usually when you work with a supplier you want to have a win-win situation and you want to trust them and for example I tend to trust the more people that are honest with me like it's okay that you have a trouble and the line gets pushed but if you tell me then I know what to do and then I tend to respect those people like for example my suppliers in the US a lot more than my suppliers in Pakistan because they lie to me all the time so for example, if I notice a mistake in the invoice or something and they charge me less than they should in the US because I love the person I work with and I trust them and they trust me then I will be more likely to let them know hey, you know, I actually you wrote that number but it should have been that, I owe you more money that's just me, how I work since trust works both ways if I notice a mistake like that on the people who kept pushing the deadline with no reason and telling me lies about deadlines and everything I tend to be less inclined to tell them that they made a mistake and that I owe them more money because I don't respect them as much so if you want them to respect you then you have to respect them and also um, work that way but so be careful with some people I would say that I should be honest with everyone but I'm really sad that some people have really different ways of taking the truth and the time than me. Something else that I want to tell you about is time zone. So for me I'm in Europe so it's GMT plus one and I work with the US where they're like GMT minus six and in China GMT plus eight or seven I think anyways so there's a big time difference so for example you have to know that when you answer your emails for example let's say I wake up in the morning and I start working and it's nine o'clock and I have ten emails some from people in the US and some people in China I should answer the the questions of the people in China first because when I wake up in the morning for them it's already mid-afternoon so if I wait until my evening to answer their questions then that means that I will only see that in their morning and then we lose one day but if I answer them in my morning then I can maybe get back to me the same day and we can fix a bunch of things and since it won't be morning in the US until maybe my lunch or a start the afternoon then I have more time to get things done with the Chinese people or Asian people and then go back to the US one so then we kind of on sync and I know that a lot of people would completely shift their work day and work at night or very early in the morning to accommodate that so you have to see what you could do that works for you but for me it works to usually think of what time is it for them and 
could I could I save some time by answering this email before this email and so it's just take that into account too and of course uh, a lot of time I have people asking me a question and they need an answer right away but for me it was three in the morning and I was sleeping and I was not checking my email I'm sorry and so a few times I've received three emails in a row like one another uh, one hour apart it's like why didn't you answer me that was urgent and I was sleeping so most of the time they won't specially take that into account themselves so you have to also take that into account. Then I would like to tell you about the payment methods. So depending on where the people are located you can do bank transfers. Usually there's a fixed fee with the suppliers that I do that. It's about 20 bucks, 20 francs, 20 euros uh, per transaction. So if you have several thousand francs, um, dollars, yeah usually all over the world with the people I work with, except in France, uh, that I paid in euros. Usually in Asia, US and everything, I pay everybody in US dollars. So most of the time they will do it in US dollars. So you also have to take into account the exchange rate of your currency against the currency that you are using with your suppliers and maybe you could negotiate a different currency if it's more interesting for you. The payment methods would be bank transfer with a fixed fee or you could go with PayPal but just know that it's a percentage of the transaction so it could be super high so if it's several thousand francs maybe it could go in the several hundreds of dollars of fees so be careful about that but it's really convenient so just know that and so usually unless it's an individual requesting you to send the money as friends and family in PayPal unless of that and if you say that you pay for goods then it's the recipient of the money the actual supplier that will pay the fees and you don't pay the fees so but maybe it's expensive for them so they will ask you to do something else you could also do credit cards i have a few suppliers not really factories but people that for example supply shoes for my children business and i have a credit card authorization file something like that so i fill a form with them and i tell them my credit card info and they store that and every time that i make an order they charge my credit card directly. So you could do that too, but I would not really do that with the factories in China or something that you don't know a lot about. I think it's way safer to send PayPal or a bank transfer. And what you should never ever ever do is Western Union. Basically Western Union was created I think to send money back to your family, for example people from Africa or something working uh, in Europe and they send money back to their family and people can just go with their passport and get the money. But it's used a lot on the internet for scams. So they will, people will tell you to send the money there and then you do that and they pick up the money with a fake passport and then they will never ship the thing. So I would say if the factory requests Western Union and they don't offer any other any other payment method, I would say don't work with them because most likely it's a scam and it's really dangerous. And the fees are so high. Like to send a few thousand francs it's like sixty bucks or something of uh, fees and so so don't. No Western Union at all. And PayPal is so reliable. Really, I never ever had any trouble with PayPal. So it's super safe. You put your credit card in there and then you just pay people with their email address. And if there's anything, uh, PayPal can refund you the money because it's insured. So that's really safe. So I will totally say go with PayPal. And the last thing that I would like to talk to you about is where to find the suppliers. So one of my supplier in the US I found through eBay. I was looking for printed shorts for cheerleading and I found that person putting an auction for that and then I didn't want that one in particular but I contacted the person behind that account and I said hey I'm looking to do custom shorts for my customers would that be something that you would be interested in 
And she said yes, and then we talked outside of eBay, which usually you are not allowed to do. You should keep your contact inside of the platform. They, they really want that because they want to avoid scam. But anyways, and now this girl has been a supplier of mine for six years or something, something crazy. And so she's fantastic and uh, sh I found her through eBay. And most of my suppliers for other t types of things Pololita or accessories like um, pins and printing stuff and shoes and dresses and everything most of them I found them through Aliexpress so there's Alibaba which is the website to put in contact suppliers and buyers but it, Alibaba is really for big quantities like you open your own factories of whatever and you need to buy tons of stuff but really like high quantity so then you go there and maybe the MOQ minimum order quantity would be like the minimum possible 1000 of something and probably most likely 10,000 or 100,000 depending on what it is so Alibaba is good for contacts because some people do have a profile in Alibaba and in Aliexpress but most of the time be aware that it's for big quantities and then the people at Alibaba made Aliexpress which is basically the same thing but a marketplace so for example Alibaba would just say advertisements of what they sell but Aliexpress would actually put stuff that you could easily buy and just one or two pieces so that's more for the individuals than the big factories but what you could do is also look at what they are offering and contacting the brands directly. That's what I do usually. Uh, I don't know if I look for pens, I, I type pins and I look at uh, all the different kind of people that do pins. I look at the price, I look at the minimum order quantity, I look at the review, that's really important. See if people are happy or not. Just so you know, I think that in some cases when they get so many negative feedback, then they just delete the product and create a new one. So be careful about that. So, but if you have a lot of good positive reviews and feedback, then it's likely to be a good factory. And then I compare the price and everything. And what I usually do when I browse, I use either the shift and my keyboard and I click on all the links that I want. So that, that opens in all different tabs or I do right click open in a new tab and I do that. And then I have so many lines of tabs and then I could go through them and compare them and drag and drop them to make like a groups of stuff. And then I compare them and when I kind of happy about what I want, then I contact them all. I do a sample email asking them what the terms are, what the MOQ are, um, how can I pay and I explain them in real detail my business, what I do, where I'm located and that I would like a first sample, like a, just one, that I'm just started and that I need really low quantities but I'm ready to pay a bit more, how much, stuff like that. So if you're interested I can give you a sample email that I write the factories with the questions and uh, what I explain and so maybe that can help you make yours. And so yeah, I send that to a bunch of different factories and then for example, if I, if I go for a new product, I might have 20 different factories that I'm looking at. So um, I do an Excel sheet with the name of the contact, the name of the factory. I also put a link to the shop or page. And then I put columns for all my questions. Is shipping included or separate? How much is shipping? What is your MOQ? What is the price per unit for that product? What are the fabrics that you have? Whatever question I could have for that particular question and new business that I want to do. And then I would say in the course of maybe one week, you'll get few answers each day. And if you, at least me, if I don't do a spreadsheet like that, then I will never be able to keep up and compare. So then, what I do is that as they give me the answer, I put them on the table and then I see that I need more info than I, I, I see quickly if they have not answered all my fields. So then I go back and ask more questions. And when, for example, 
I get no answer or they tell me no or I see that it's way way too high for me then I just start putting them in red and the ones that I expect that it will work I put them in yellow and when I have somebody that just looks really good then I put them in green and then at some point I decide okay now it's been like I don't know one week or two weeks now I need to make a decision then I sort by color and I just discard all the red ones of course I don't delete them because at some point if I need to go back to them for something else I want to know that they were bad or I want to know what the price was and maybe or something that was a deal breaker for me at some point might not be so I keep that info but I just right now it's red because I don't need them but maybe later and so then I look at the green ones and then I find some way to pick amongst the ones so for example if it's dresses and I really want to start my business with that then like I did for um, the first batch of dresses for Fluffy Tori I sent the same design to the three factories and then I just looked at how they interpreted it the cost, the time, whatever and I wrote all that down I, I sent it that time, they shipped it that time it came out well, it came out not well, blah 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 and I would say if you can make your choice based only on your spreadsheet and that info that they gave you it's way better because you don't spend too much time and money trying different supplies but if you can't and if it's really important and you can't afford to make one sample with each factory maybe that's safer and then you will know when you have the product in hand which one is the best and so that's what i could recommend if you can afford to do that but for pins for example i would not do that because i would I don't want, they, they will not make just one and I would not want to have 50 of the same pin done by, by three factories. For pins I was lucky, I found somebody fantastic for the first time so that was really good but dresses, I don't know, it's harder. So that was my very long video about how to find a supplier and what to negotiate with them and I'm pretty sure that if you're interested in that subject and have less experience than me that might have helped you but that you might have more and more questions so feel free to write them in a comment and I will answer them and if you're willing to start your own business please let me know and I'm sure I can help of course I will not share my the contact of my suppliers right now because it's kind of a secret and uh, I worked very hard to find them but if you have a different industry than me I can totally help you orient you to look or if you're willing to start your own business but you really don't want to look for suppliers or to deal with suppliers at all I could do that as a consultant help you find the suppliers and then talk to them and uh, order that for you so if you're interested in doing that you can contact me in the comments or in my email that you find for business inquiries in my profile so i will be totally open to consult you on that if you want so i hope this was helpful and if it is please let me know and you can find on my channel many other videos about my journey as a small business and feel free to watch the other videos i will do a small business playlist if that interests you you can go see all the different other videos like um, how to find an artist or um, the story of how i created my other uh, companies and so probably more that I will do in the future and if you have a specific question feel free to ask it in the comment too so I can do a video about it to help more people so thank you so much for watching and see you soon bye bye <music>